Moin zusammen and welcome to our first episode in English. Sorry in advance for any poor wording or wrong pronunciation, thanks to this wonderful German accent you all know and love. I hope you can enjoy the episode anyway. I definitely did, as I had the great honor as well as pleasure of interviewing the renowned anthropologist Professor Dr. Jean-Jacques Hublin. Starting off with his childhood in French Algeria, we talked about the correct use of the phrase human species, dive deep into evidence of higher intelligence of Neanderthals, as well as our role in the extinction of other hominy. And that's not all, but find out yourselves. Enjoy! French. Uh, I was born in North Africa, yeah. um, which may explain part of my interest for this area. And uh, I was trained as a, initially as a geologist, then as a physical anthropologist, paleontologist, and I always had uh, interest in, uh, in paleolithic archaeology, so on the, the, the behavior of ancient humans and not just their uh, anatomy or uh, physical evolution. Um, I have been uh, a researcher for many years. Uh, I started uh, in France in CNRS. I also worked I, at university as a teacher, as a professor. And um, I was invited to teach in the U.S. in, in several places. And uh, eventually, in the year 2002-2003, I was approached by the Max Planck Society, uh, which wanted to create a new uh, department of human evolution in, in, the, in the Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology here in Leipzig. And eventually I was, I was uh, offered the, the job. And so I moved to Germany and uh, I've been living here now for more than 15 years. And um, I think this institute is probably one of the best places on earth to, to do what I, I want to do. So it's a, it's a great place to work. Uh, the conditions are excellent. Uh, more importantly, I'm surrounded by very talented people in my department and in other departments of the Institute. And for a scientist, it's very important to, to be in this kind of environment, to interact with colleagues, with students. Uh, I think the worst thing that can happen to uh, a scientist is to be somehow isolated uh, from this kind of uh, of interactions. Yeah, I completely understand that. And as you said, you were born in Northern Africa. Actually, you were born in French Algeria. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Well, actually, I was born in France. Uh, when I was born, it was a part of France, just like Corsica or Britain. Uh, it changed a little bit uh, when uh, I was uh, about eight years old. So I was uh, expelled from the country. Uh, with my family and uh, had to move back. I mean, not back because I never had a chance to visit uh, European France uh, in my life, but so we were sort of deported to Northern France in this time period. And uh, of course, I think uh, these historical events probably have some kind of uh, influence on my uh, a personality and way to see uh, things, uh, my place in society in general, and uh, probably also, um, I would say, since my childhood, uh, my interest for um, natural history and in general the beauty of nature, present day nature and past nature may be explained by uh, somehow the kind of murky environment where I, I grew up. 
So I can hear that you're still kind of emotionally attached to, to Northern Africa. Is that correct? Uh, we, yes, of course. I'm emotionally, uh, I would say, impacted by, by my uh, childhood. Uh, well, you know, I grew up in the middle of uh, a war. So, you know, as, as a child, I... Uh, I knew what was what a massacre was, you know? so I think uh, something you don't forget. And um, so I have mixed feelings because, uh, of course, I like to go uh, to Morocco uh, to meet the kind of uh, colors and smells and uh, sounds that I, 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 I grew up with. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my, I would say my North African experience is not entirely positive, to, to say the least. And um, I, I had to, how to say, you know, we, one always says that uh, immigrants or people who are obliged to move from one place to another, they have a sort of special... Sometimes they have a special kind of uh, uh, strength to adapt and to try to uh, manage things, achieve uh, things in, in, in life. And I think, yes, I, 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 sometimes I feel like, I would not say it was a chance, uh, it was a, uh, a, a luck to, uh, to have all these experiences, but um, probably I, can, I could, for example, easily move from uh, one country to another more easily than people who grew up in their you know, hometown, village, uh, surrounded by their familiar environment. And uh, so I think, one should, of course, make uh, strengths from our weaknesses or our uh, wounds, and uh, I try to do that. <laughs> it's a good view, and I don't want to d uh, dive too deep into it because we have so many topics, but, you know, for me, I'm born in 94, so I think most of my generation have no idea that Algeria or uh, was was actually part of France. It was not just a colony. It was part of France. Uh, so what you're ex uh, explaining here is, is, I think, very new to many many people. And then uh, you arrived at Paris, if I'm not uh, incorrect. Um, how were you received? Were you rejected, or were they happy that you ca uh, came back? Air quotes. Well, actually, we. Uh uh, we did not arrive in in, uh, in Paris. We uh, when we moved from uh, when I moved from Algeria to Europe, I uh, I was sent without my family because my family could not could not make it. So I was sent alone uh, with my with an uncle. How old you were, were you then? Eight. Eight. And so I lived uh, a rather long period with this uncle and aunt who were living uh, in Ardennes, not in northern France, uh, close to the border with uh, Luxembourg and uh, Belgium there. So to me, it was a very, I would say, different environment. And um, and in in the in this, uh, I would say, uh, historical crisis. <laughs> can call it this way, uh, uh, there was uh, about a million of uh, uh, people who moved from one side to the Mediterranean to the other side in a very short period. And uh, we are not very welcome. <laughs> we are not very welcome. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was... Uh, that was part of the uh, of the difficulty to uh, adapt to this uh, new new environment. Mm. But were you from the people in France? Were you received as French, or were you received at something you know similar? But you're not actually part of us. Well, uh, the the how to say the situation in France in this in these years around the the, the war in Algeria. 
uh, you know, France has been on the on the verge of a civil war in this time mm. period, uh, and uh, and so there were very strong, uh, I would say, political sort of uh, oppositions about uh, should Algeria be French or not. Uh, there was there was a lot of violence uh, on on both sides. Uh, there were violence between French and Algerians. There were violence between Algerians and other Algerians, and there were violence between French and other French. And um, and so um, um, it took some years for these these things to sort of settle for the for the. Uh, French coming from Algeria in in in, uh, in Europe, um, I would say probably the relationship between uh, Algerian people and French people uh, were never completely, uh, we say, cleaned from from these uh, this historical episode. And still today, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that. Uh, young uh, French uh, pupils are taught uh, about, you know, uh, all the bad things about uh, colonialism and uh, the war of the French army against the Algerian. And, and of course, the, the, the French uh, families who had people in their, in their uh, among them who had been uh, murdered, uh, basically, they, they, they are not very positive about this period either. So uh, I think it will take a long time to sort of uh, calm down. Yeah, absolutely. So, but as a result, already as a young child, you had the, let's say, chance to see how the human mind works when it's basically down to uh, uh, you or me. Uh, so did that already as a, as a young kid um, it makes you very interested in, in, let's say, social cohesion and how people people think and how how people evolve well i think as a kid i was uh i was more interested in sort of uh somehow escaping the reality of things and uh and and to me uh, as i said um growing up in some bad neighborhoods of the northern suburb of Paris um, gave me the, the, the this interest for you know uh, exotic fauna and butterflies and shells and everything and and then I discovered fossils and I realized that um, uh, beyond present time, there were in the past other natures that existed. So initially, I was more interested by, I would say, uh, ancient worlds in general. And and then I came into uh, the human side of the of the story. But uh, what, what's true is that probably compared to some of my colleagues, if you want to make a connection between my childhood and my way of thinking of the past of humans uh, probably have a more, uh, I would say, a pessimistic view on human nature than some others. You know, some, especially when we speak about ancient times, uh, I know a lot of people who tend to think that uh, ancient times were wonderful. Uh, humans lived in... Uh, you know, in, in, in balance with nature and they were sort of uh, ecologists uh, and uh, pacifists and very friend with their neighbors and etc. Uh, to me, that's a fantasy of uh, Westerners uh, from the early 21st centuries who never experienced uh, what the, the bad side of human nature can be. And, um, and so... Uh, each historical period uh, has its own way to uh, its own values. And speaking about the, the prehistory, the Paleolithic times, uh, it's quite clear that uh, since the 19th century up to now, uh, we uh, each, each, each period 
sort of projected in the past its own values. So in 19th century, people, they were, you know, they, they, they were racist. They were, uh, and they had no problem with, with uh, violence or so they would see cannibals among Neanderthals and things like that. So there were clearly a change in the course of the 20th century. And today, uh, I think uh, often we fall in another extreme. And the other extreme is, is uh, this sort of, um, I would say, eco-pacifist view of uh, Paleolithic times, which mm. is probably as much a fantasy as the fantasies of the people of 19th century. The problem is that we tend to think that we are much uh, better equipped to uh, reconstruct uh, the past than people when you know, prehistory was just found, invented. Yeah. Uh, but but um, uh, I think, yes, we are better equipped in terms of uh, reconstructing a number of things um having a, a, a better way to measure time to reconstruct environment uh, to analyze the, the the techniques of ancient humans uh, but now of course when it comes to uh human behavior in terms of uh, you know what kind of interaction humans had uh, i think uh, there is a lot of space for uh, as I said, fantasies, and uh, and these fantasies are still present uh, today. I, I'm, I'm I'm absolutely convinced of that. Probably, the people uh, in in twenty years or fifty years from now, people will make fun of some of the things we say today, just as we make fun of uh, what uh, people uh, said uh, in 1920 or in 1880 or whatever. Sure. And you're working quite internationally, obviously. Um, so would you say there's a difference uh, between, let's say, uh, what's so, the so-called Western countries where people actually don't know uh, really bad times anymore and your colleagues in, for example, Northern Africa or something like this, are there less people who are, who are drawn to these fantasies? Well, frankly speaking, uh, the research in, in uh, uh, origins in general, it's not a neutral uh, topic. And I think there are very strong cultural differences uh, regarding this, this, uh, this question and, and even not just what people think about origins and, and past, but even the interest for origins and past varies a lot. So to say it bluntly, uh, prehistory, human paleontology, human evolution is essentially a Western sort of uh, Western culture activity, if I can phrase it this way. Um, of course, it, it existed, it developed gradually in other countries, but for a very long time, uh, the core of of this of this uh, science were uh, was in 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 the Western world, in Europe, in North America. Even even today, there are there. It's to me it's striking to see how some countries, uh, say China, for example, China has a lot of uh, activities in the field of paleontology, and this has been lasting for a long time. Uh, and it, it, it's uh, my view on that is that in the in the in the Chinese way of seeing China and the Chinese people and the past, uh, there is this preoccupation about uh, uh, continuity, origins, and etc. And so there have been a continuous interest for that. There are countries where I don't say people don't pay a shit of of, uh, of paleontology, but obviously there are countries where this field is not developed and it's not just because there is no money or there is no fossils or there is no there are different there are cultural differences and uh, and i think uh, um, again i think uh, of course if you put aside uh, science as a 
something that generates techniques and uh, innovation, which of course it's somebody more or less everybody would like to 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 uh, let's say uh, achieve. Uh, now, when it comes to other fields of science, uh, which are uh, say more you know. Uh, they purely dedicated to increase the knowledge. Yeah. Uh, there are there are branches of knowledge w- w- that are more interesting to some uh, cultures or groups of humans than others. Sure. So to get to the the actual topic <laughs> that you you are uh, covering, um, the, when I go to Wikipedia on your page, uh, it just tells me he is best known for his work on the Pleistocene hominins. So I already hear the questions. So could you please give us, as a starter, a definition? What is the Pleistocene and what are hominins? Maybe I start with hominins. So hominins, uh, what we call hominins, is all the different species uh, more or less related to, to us. When I say related, either because they are direct ancestors or because they are cousins or sister groups of um, of us that uh, existed uh, in the ascendance of humans since the separation with the branch leading to present day chimpanzees so back eight million years ago or so there is a divide between the ancestors of uh, present day humans and the ancestors of common chimpanzees and bonobos Everything that branch on this lineage going to humans is called hominins, uh, which means that there are hominins which are not ancestral to us because they got extinct. And uh, it means also that hominins uh, can be very different from, uh, from humans. It's when you move back in time, they, they are very different indeed. And uh, when you are close to the the origin of hominins, they, they look more probably like the ancestors of chimpanzees than present day humans. Um, now, all this covers uh, a long period of time. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned, uh, probably 8 million years or so. Uh, so personally, I'm working on the the part of this tree that is best documented, which is the last, <clears throat> the last period that we call the Pleistocene. So the Pleistocene uh, has been defined different ways. It changed sometime. Uh, let's say it's the last 2.6 million years. And, um, and it's a time period where we see uh, what we call the genus Homo, which is the the bigger group to which our species belong, the genus Homo, we are Homo sapiens, but there are other Homo um, developed and, um, and, and diversified. And eventually, uh, this ended with the, um, I would say, the, the explosive development almost of one species, which is our species, at the expense of all the other groups of hominins that exist. So in the, um, uh, the last uh, couple of hundred thousand years, we see still diverse group of hominins, but there is one that evolved in Africa for a long time that eventually left Africa and then uh, very recently uh, in the last um, say 50,000 years, moved into all sorts of places on the planet. It has already expanded a bit in, in Asia much uh, before, but in the last 50,000 years, it moved in the mid latitudes of Eurasia and then replaced and absorbed, uh, partly absorbed uh, local hominins that were there. This expansion never really ended. Uh, 30,000 years ago, Homo sapiens was on the, on the, uh, on the, the banks of the, of the 
the Arctic Sea almost there, and then, you know, expanded into Americas and people, all sorts of islands. It had moved already in Australia. So there is this final expansion of our species. So it's very spectacular. Absolutely. So we're talking about 2.8 million years. Um, how many hominins are we talking about? So how many different types of hominins were there in this time that we know of? Uh, uh, well, in general, for all, all hominins, uh, we, we know, uh, I mean, it depends how you count them, but we're talking about 25, 30, something like that, uh, different hominins. Um, Hominins are much more, much better documented for the last million years than the, for the beginning of the story. If you move, say, beyond uh, four or five million years ago, we have very few species of hominins. Mm. And, and, uh, and it, it does not mean that there were no more species of hominins. It means that we know uh, very few of them. Um, and uh, and this, of course, uh, raise, uh, raises one uh, important issue: is that uh, the paleontological uh, record is 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 not complete. So we miss a lot of information, um, and and this is especially true the more you move back in time. Uh, do do we know the the common ancestor of today's chimpanzees and us, or is that one of those white spots? No, it's a it's a white spot. We we have a notion of when uh, this this uh, creature lived because of uh, more about molecular data, uh, genetic data, so we can compute when when the the coalescence between these lineages could be in time. There are problems with this kind of computation, but we have a rough idea. And then, uh, say, after seven millions, we start having fossils which seem to be already on the side of hominins, which uh, implies that there were others on the, on the other side, but, but the others, we don't know them. I mean, the, the, the origin of chimpanzees, we have no fossils, basically. We have very, very few fossils on the side of uh, African apes. We have more on the side of, of hominins, um, but again, I mean, we have a very fragmentary documentation. So, uh, if we look at the last few hundred thousand years, where the fossil record is much better, uh, what subspecies are we are we talking about? I mean, everyone knows the Neanderthals, knows knows us. Uh, who else was there in the last few hundred thousand years? Uh, well, already there, there is a discussion about what, sh what we should call a species. And that, that would be a, a topic that deserves a lot of, of uh, discussions because um, uh, every group of biologists who have to cope with, with species uh, had its own definition of species. Uh, since the middle of the 20th century, the, the definition, the concept of species that was most successful is the so-called uh, biological concept of species, uh, which is a bit funny because the other definitions of species are also biological, by, by the way, <laughs> but mostly. But, um, and, and it's a notion that the species is, is characterized by uh, reproductive isolation. So that, uh, sorry, what? What isolation? Re reproductive isolation. Ah, yeah, okay. Basically, animals, creatures that can reproduce together, they form a species, and when they cannot repro reproduce with others, others are another species. Hmm. So it looks like a nice definition, but it has, it has, uh, it has limitations. And there is an obvious limitation when you deal with fossils. Because fossils, there is no way in general to know if they can reproduce or not because uh, you know, they died a long time ago. Um, so paleontologists tend to use other uh, proxies for, for the definition of species. Uh, there is another problem is that because evolution modifies organisms through time, so if you wait long enough, 
uh, the descendants of uh, descendants of a given organism can become quite different from its ancestors. And the question is uh, where you put the limit and you say, okay, now it's another species. Of course, there is no limit because there is a continuity, a chain of, of reproduction all along this line. So you see that uh, using species when you speak about the past is, is complicated. Um, furthermore, uh, recently, uh, the study of fossil DNA, ancient DNA, developed a lot. And so we do have the genome, the D, the, we can sequence the DNA of some uh, groups of hominins or other mammals that are not present on, on Earth today. Mm. And uh, that's the case, for example, for Neanderthals. So we don't go very far back in time. Huh? We, we can go you know, easily a, f a couple of 10,000 years ago. More, it's more difficult to go a couple of 100,000 years ago. But say beyond 400,000 years ago, we have no ancient DNA for humans, at least. We have ancient DNA for a horse that was uh, mummified in frozen ground in Yukons. 700,000 years ago, that's about the oldest thing we have. Um, and so by studying this, this DNA, what we can see is that they were events of reproduction, hybridization between, say, Neanderthals and, and present-day humans. So you could argue that Neanderthals and present-day humans are, uh, in fact, one species, and it should not be called different species. Now, what happened is that uh, this genetic and paleogenetic uh, studies developed a lot uh, in the recent years. And what was found is that, in fact, about a quarter of the living species of mammals interbred at some point in the past with other groups that we consider as different species, but they interbred. And uh, in fact, hybridization between closely related species is, is, is something rather trivial. It, it happens a lot. So uh, it, it, uh, it happens among different species of elephants, of, of carnivores, of, uh, of monkeys, of, uh, of whales, of all sorts of creatures. And um, so what the way we see that today is that, in fact, this uh, separation of different species, one from the other, it's a long process. It's not something happening uh, overnight. I mean, normally, unless there is some kind of major mutation making reproduction really difficult. But uh, in general, it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's, it's not an event. It's a process. And so along this process, uh, the, the possibility to interbreed with uh, another population, another species, uh, can reduce gradually until it becomes impossible. But before it becomes impossible, there are all sorts of situations where, yes, it's possible, but the offspring uh, does not survive, or it's possible uh, for uh, one sex to, to one sex of hybrids to be fertile, but not the other uh, sex, all sorts of things like that. So in other words, the, the limits of species are a bit uh, fuzzy, in fact, uh, more fuzzy than we would like. And, and if you add this to what I said about the, the difficulty of dealing with evolution through time of species, it means that there is a lot of discussions about how we, we should call ancient groups of hominins that we recognize as different entities because they have a different morphology, they can sometimes have different behaviors, ecology, whatever. And uh, th there is a trend among biologists to say, okay, let's forget about all these uh, criteria of uh, uh, reproductive isolation and other features that are used to define species. Let's look at the, the sort of consistency of lineages that exist through time 
and maintain their their sort of identity. And uh, of course, in the beginning, they can interbreed with the neighbors, but that's after a certain point in their evolution, even if they can interbreed a little bit with others, they, they are mechanism keeping them somehow isolated. Mm. And we are going to call this a species, so this, this kind of branch. And so if you accept this kind of view on a species, so then you could say Neanderthals are a different species. There are people thinking it's a different species. What's important is I think uh, all this discussion about definition of species, sometimes it's a bit rhetorical. Mm. Uh, because I think what's important is to have words to name things, A, and B, to know what we're speaking about. So to me, uh, to speak about species that can hybridize with other species is not, is not a problem if we know what we're, what we're talking about. And if we want, because the problem is if you, if you in, enforce a strict definition of the, 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 the reproductive isolation to recognize species, it means that you, you may have to drop in the same species a lot of things which are uh, quite different. For example, among bears, basically all the bears on earth, they can interbreed, you know? So uh, I mean, black bears, they, when they interbreed with, uh, interbreed with brown bears, they produce, uh, not so um, uh, successful uh, offspring, but the, it happened, it, 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 it was already described. But basically, yeah, I mean, all the brown bears, the cave bears, the polar bears, everything you say, okay, that's one species. And of course, people working on, the, on these groups and working on the ecology of these groups say, but they, they, these creatures are completely different. And although they can interbreed, uh, and it, it can even happen in nature, but the reality is that they existed as separate species already for uh, half a million years. Mm. You know? And so why we would drop everything in one bag? Because by doing that, we lose <laughs> somehow uh, information, we lose a way to handle these groups. Uh, and, and now, you, of course, you could say, okay, we're going to call everything subspecies of something else. Well, it's going to make the, the books and the articles longer, <laughs> but it's not going to change what we're talking about. Yeah, if you now call everything a subspecies, which was before a species, it makes no difference to what you said before. It's just rhetorical, as you say. So, because... When, when what you use now a lot is is group of group of people or groups of people and that's for me that's that's sometimes a bit confusing when i read about a group of people i think like it was a tribe or you know a group in a in a cave and then there the came another species so for for the one who is not very deep into this topic it's probably easier to understand what you're talking about if you're talking about species and not of groups You, you should, we should not ignore that there is some kind of, I would say, philosophical and ideological issues underlying all that. Uh, because humans made a lot of efforts to recognize themselves as different from the rest of the living world. And so, especially in modern societies, uh, humans are, are, are unique. And they, I would say they are exceptional and they are one thing, you know. So if you think on all the issues about recognizing differences between humans and all what is related to racism and, and things like that, you can imagine easily that recognizing um, differences among past groups uh, is, not, is not that innocent somehow. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and there is a, a, obviously a preoccupation of uh, some of my colleagues to you know, sort of export uh, differences from the past into the present. Or, and so somehow we would like the past to be as homogeneous as the present is. But the problem with this is that today there is only one species of humans on Earth. It is quite homogeneous because it has a rather... 
a recent common origin somewhere, you know. And 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 uh, sometimes we do we would have liked that the past was the same, but the past was in fact never like that. And so if you move in the past uh, more than fifty thousand years ago or forty thousand years ago, you see much more diversity than you have today okay and and especially what has been found in the recent years is that even in the very recent let's say the last half million year or so, or so uh, we have on earth uh, at least uh, five maybe more different groups of hominins and some of them are really different and and so it seems very difficult not to call them different species and so in other words uh, uh th there there is this trend that when you speak about um, hominins living more than let's say two or three million years ago people have no problem using uh linean uh, latin names you know you called uh, australopithecus afarensis uh, homo habilis or etc no problem people use that a lot the more you move close to the present and the more you see discomfort with these kind of denominations and so we prefer to speak about neanderthals and modern humans and denisovans and uh, uh, the Hobbit from Flores or whatever, and there is a sort of resistance in using the, the kind of um, vocabulary that we would use exactly for the same kind of differences three million years ago, four million years ago. Uh, and I think it's, it's just because uh, if you think on all the debates about the status of Neanderthals, I, I think is because the closer we come to present day humans and the more this notion of difference is seen as a problematic sort of issue. Uh, because again, the fear is that I think unconsciously or consciously, the fear is that this could be sort of, um, yeah, uh, influencing our views on, on present day humans mm, yeah i get why it's, it gets ideological there so but if we would take an example if we would take the the neanderthals and us so the the homo sapiens uh right next to each other um uh, most people probably have in mind like like the neanderthals were kind of a half ape um uh, not standing upright uh, you know completely uh, full of hair everywhere so this is the picture of the general public of the neanderthals so if you put uh, put them right next to one of us how big would the difference be in uh, you know like like size strength posture and so on well um that, that's not an easy question of course what you described the picture we have of neanderthals for most people is 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 a picture of cartoons you know it's it's it has nothing to do with reality so uh, uh neanderthals were were fully bipedal they had nothing reminding apes or whatever uh they were you could say they are humans Uh, they are humans with a big brain, with a, a, a complex uh, behavior. Uh, but after you said everything, uh, all these things, um, it does not mean that they are really like us. Okay, uh, and uh, and and it's quite clear that just speaking about bones, because this is what we have. You know, I often, I mean, in past, I used often to uh, go sometime in schools and to speak with kids to show fossils and things. It always struck me that if you show skulls of uh, ancient humans um, and you put on the table skulls of different things, even kids from, from primary school, uh, they see right away that uh, skulls of uh, present-day humans from all, all sorts of places on Earth, 
are just the same. It's very difficult for, you know, you don't see differences in, in skull morphology. If you put a skull of Neanderthal, even, even you know, eight years old kids, they, they tell you, oh, this one is really, is really weird, is really different. Mm. And so there were aspects in the, in the morphology of Neanderthals that probably to us would be very striking in terms of differences. The facial uh, morphology of Neanderthal is very distinctive. And then, of course, there are other aspects which are <coughs> different to uh, discuss because we don't have... I, I think in general, we are probably, when we deal with other humans or any kind of creature, we are sensitive to things like, uh, I would say, the, the, the surface aspect, you know, the skin, the hair, things like that, that we don't have, of course, for Neanderthals. And so we can speculate what we want, but... We don't know. Um, and, and of course, something even more important, the, the, the behavior, the look, the way, you know, this, this creature would, would, uh, would be, it's something that is, is difficult to reconstruct or to imagine even. And so here again, there is this, basically, the, 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 if you put aside the caricatures that has been produced, there is, there is a pendulum where, some, at some time in the past, people wanted to see Neanderthals are very different from us. Uh, yeah, ape-like somehow. But, but recently, the pendulum went completely the other direction. Uh, and um, uh, and, and uh, you know, if you go to the Neanderthal Museum uh, near Dusseldorf, there is a Neanderthal uh, there, the reconstruction of a Neanderthal that is dressed with a... Um, a suit and a hat and is, is, you know, watching the guys visiting. And uh, you may say, oh, yeah, finally, if you put a hat on his head and etc., it looks like somebody you could meet in the, you know, in the train somewhere. So, so but, yeah. but ba basically, we, as you say, we don't really have an idea what he looked outside besides his bones. Or is there any way to, to oh, go I to his bones and his DNA and think like it's more probably that his skin looked like this or that he was hairy or not? Oh, or? I, I, think, I think we have a good idea of, the, of the, the gross anatomy. I think we can make a good reconstruction of the proportion of the body, mm. the... Um, the, the the shape of the face of the skull, things like that. But now, after you 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 do that, uh, as I said, everything which is the surface of the body, the skin, the hair, the eyes, how they look like this, this we don't know. And maybe this would, I would say, influence us in our feelings about this creature as much as the, the general anatomy. Now, the other thing which I, I found really striking uh, as, as a paleontologist is that when one compare Neanderthals and, and uh, present day humans or, or recent Homo sapiens, uh, we find differences in almost everything you, you, you look at. So you look at the shape of the, the inner ear, uh, you look at the dental morphology, you look at the shape of the pelvis or the uh, the way the trunk is built or the body proportion or any for everything you would find a difference which means to me that if there would be a neanderthal uh, entering the room here i would probably see that it's not a usual human uh, and uh I think I had a colleague who, by the way, I think he changed a bit his mind about that. Who used to say, um, if if I would if I would be because there is always this joke about a Neanderthal in the metro that would be dressed like a, a, a Parisian would be invisible and uh, and have a. I had a friend who used to say, well, uh, if if a uh, just even if a a modern human like us, but fifty thousand years old, would enter the the metro, I would probably change the car. I would go another. <laughs> and he said, if it would be a Neanderthal, probably I would take another train. Uh, so I, I'm not very convinced by the notion that 
uh, ancient humans would be invisible in, uh, among us. Mm. Especially when you move back in time, of course. Sure. So, so that's like the the outer outer case. This is what what they looked like. But you've already sa uh, said that they have quite a lot a large brain, or they used to have. So, what about their intelligence? What what do we know about? I mean, you probably can s tell something from from their art, their tools, uh, their social behavior. Uh, were they as intelligent as our an ancestors to this time? Or, I mean, not saying that they they not both of them would be our ancestors. Um, well, again, when you compare Neanderthals to uh, our species, it's important to specify to uh, what kind of Homo sapiens you are comparing them. Because uh, Homo sapiens evolved quite a lot in the last three or 200,000 years. So uh, uh, probably Homo sapiens 300,000 years ago uh, 300,000 years old would look to us probably would seem to us probably as as I would say different uh, from us than the Neanderthal. And that's a, that's another another story um, about brain. Where well, yes, I mean uh, I mentioned these different groups of hominins that exist in the last uh, half million year mi million years. Among these uh, hominins, there are several. Uh, groups that show an increase of the brain size. And this is because they are pushed into the same kind of pressure of selection. They, they, they have a more complex behavior. They are more technology, maybe more social complexity, things like that. It's not the case of all, all these hominins. We have at least two cases where we have hominins where the brain is not bigger, uh, and even one where we, it looks like the brain became smaller in, in the course of evolution. And the, this, this hobbit from Flores, mm. this little creature. But let's say the, the big groups like Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovan, they seem to be uh, guys with, with uh, always with big brain and bigger and bigger brains. But this being said, does not mean that, that uh, when you say Neanderthals, they have a big brain, does not mean they have the same big brain like we have. Voilà. Because brain is not just a, you know, a big bubble where you put intelligence inside and you blow it and uh, you become more intelligent because the balloon becomes bigger. Um, and also, it's very naive to... Uh, discuss intelligence in terms of uh, one one species or one group of hominins or even one individual is more intelligent than another because there is not a simple measure of intelligence. So uh, if you speak about, I would say, cognitive abilities more than intelligence, um, there are different skills. There are different, you know, uh, there are people, even just speaking about extant humans, there are people who are extremely gifted for, I would say, practical intelligence. Uh, but it does not mean that they have a very high social intelligence or mm -hmm. uh, linguistic abilities or things like that. So there are, intelligence is not one box, okay? It's several modules that interact, there is general intelligence, and then there are different aspects of cognitive skills. And so I'm convinced that Neanderthals, as I said, were complex creatures. They were able to produce uh, all sorts of techniques and artifacts. But now the question is, if you say, oh, you know, Neanderthals were using glue. Mm -hmm. Well, fine, great. Uh, does it say something about the complexity of their social organization? I don't think so. I think it says something about the ability to use glue. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, and, and so uh, uh, that's the problem is that in general, for the Paleolithic time, we have a lot of information about material culture. We have a lot of stone tools. We can reconstruct the techniques to produce all these tools. We have a lot of, um, 
of, 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 of bone tools. We know things about some time about how um, dwellings were organized. Well, already with dwellings, we, we do see that might be differences between Neanderthals and more recent hominins. But of course, what what we what is much more difficult to uh, to to sort of assess is everything which is related to inter individual interactions or 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 uh, or, or relationship between groups, and probably this is a key aspect that that we are not really able to easily reconstruct mm. um, you know one of the features of of the humans and speaking about humans today humans uh, is their ability to build up networks of of people and humans are able to build up networks very uh, extended networks i mean today you know with internet you can belong to a network covering the planet, but it's an old story. I mean, humans, they, through their evolution, they have been able to build networks always bigger. And these networks, they are, they basically, they allow coalitions of many individuals to achieve a task like things, for example, of, you know, sending people beyond an ocean on boats, you know, things like that. Um, so it's a, it's a key aspect of humans that uh, well we don't see in other primates. I mean chimpanzees they live in groups. They there is there is a group of chimpanzee for sure. They have interaction. They have relationship. Uh, now with other groups already they are in general rather hostile and and certainly they don't build up networks of many groups over a large region, which is something. So. This is the kind of things we would like to know about about uh, Neanderthals or older hominins. Is what is the kind of size of net social network these these hominins had? Uh, personally, I have no doubt that these networks were smaller than than uh, in in recent human evolution, but it does not mean that they did not exist at all. So uh, you know that's another problem when you speak about. Uh, Ancient hominin is that human mind likes simple notions and pictures in black and white. So sure. I give talks and people they ask me, they say, did Neanderthal speak? You know. Of course they spoke, but the question is to say what? You know. Uh, so if you think on language, for example, it's not something that you know happen one day you know people did not wake up one morning speaking so there is a lot of evolution and vocal communication exists even in 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 monkeys you know there are some kind of vocal communication and so probably the the, the story of uh, the history of language in general it's it's a, it's a long story and so it's likely that there are different stages in the past where uh, hominins had vocal communication, syntax, simple syntax, more complex syntax. Uh, at some point, syntaxes to speak about things that even don't exist. Uh, and so uh, the question when, when we, we speak uh, about Neanderthals or other hominins, older hominins, is always can we really set them into, uh, uh, along this, this chain of evolution? And the risk is that we, we, you know, we, we, give, we want to give simple answers. That, for yeah. example, there's a debate about, about burials. And of course, for us, burials means a lot of things. You know, you 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 bury people because you think. Uh, I mean, traditionally, people thought that it's not just a way to take care of dead people, but it's always a, an expression of concern, an expression, and 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 it's related to religion and to the belief that maybe there is a life after death and all sorts of things like that. If you look at what, what uh, 
chimpanzees or gorilla do. If, uh, if one of them die, they are concerned. You know, they're, they're, they don't ignore the, the cadaver. Yeah. They, there are examples of mothers carrying the dead body of their child, trying to feed it, and etc. Uh, uh, there are examples where uh, apes would cover the, the, dead, the dead body with leaves or branches or things like that. And so if you think that this exists in, in these apes, so it's almost certain that things like that existed in the past of hominids and even probably in a very remote uh, time. And the problem is that, of course, there is a, a huge distance between covering a body with leaves or stones or branches and putting a pharaoh into a pyramid with uh, you know, a lot of uh, objects and a lot of writings about gods on the walls. Sure. And humans went through all sorts of stages, uh, including Neanderthals. And so the problem is that often you meet debates where people, they say, oh, you know, we found a, a Neanderthals that looked to be in a, a pit, you know, that has been covered with ground. And so these guys, they believed in, they had a religion and they believed in afterlife, uh, after a death life and things like that. I think it's, it's just projecting our own belief on, on the past hominids. And, 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 and of course, the problem is that it can be many reasons why you would put a body in a pit and cover it with ground uh, or stones or whatever. And, uh, and I think it's very difficult to reconstruct. And, uh, and so uh, this, this notion that we're talking about the presence or absence of a human feature, I think, is 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 totally misleading. Mm. But I, I, I totally see, see where where you're coming from there, because when you said they buried uh, Neanderthals buried their their dead, uh, I also first uh, thought like, okay, maybe they thought about some afterlife style because we combine this with religion. But as you say. Uh, perhaps there are other reasons like they didn't want to get diseases from the dead bodies or something like this. I mean, if, if I, go gorillas and apes do, the, do this, I, think, I don't think they believe in afterlife. No, but they, they may, might have want to protect the bodies from sure. decay or carnivores or whatever. They had some concern, affection for an individual. Now, did they build up a whole, I would say, a religion around that or very complex belief about uh, all sorts of legends about what happens after death. I think this is pure fantasy. This is mm. pure speculation. You can, you can imagine that if you want, but you can also say, no, you know, they, uh, they just did not want to have this, this individual uh, uh, abandoned and rotting in, uh, out there. And they, they prefer to have it buried. So, um, um, yeah, I think, uh, and, and you have this kind of discussion for many, many features. And I think the problem is that more than the, the presence of, or the absence of a feature, we should be more uh, concerned by the, 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 the frequency, the intensity, the complexity of a, a, a behavior. And I think this is more the way to address these issues. Uh, there, there, there is, you know, there, there is, uh, coming back to Neanderthal, there are discussions about Neanderthal art. Um, the fact that, for example, Neanderthals might have uh, pendants, uh, things like that. But honestly, uh, well, the, 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 if you look in the, in, the, in the archaeological record, how many of these things that we have that we could argue maybe would be this kind of symbolic expression. We're talking about very, very, very few. So I'm not saying it does not exist. I'm saying this is not something which is frequent and systematic in the repertoire of Neanderthals. The way it is in the, the, the modern Homo sapiens that came from Africa and replaced them, where there you see that these guys, they have these behaviors in much more systematic way. 
And so I think it's 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 important to keep this in mind and just to you know it's not because you find six shells somewhere that has been collected by Neanderthals and nobody really knows what they did with these shells. Uh, it does not mean the same that uh, uh, you know what you would find in contemporary sites in Africa, uh, where you have sometimes hundreds of shells that are in one site, and 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 it is always the same species of mollusk that has been pierced or used with a natural hole to make some kind of of necklace or decoration. So I think it's it's a question of scale of magnitude that should be considered. Mm, absolutely. So, um, but because you just mentioned both again, when did, according to the fossil record, when did Neanderthals and Homo sapiens meet the first time? Well, uh, so the 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 story of the the, the divergence of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens uh, is 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 primarily resulting from geography is our species, our lineage, and the ancestors of our species lived in Africa. And uh, Neanderthals are the descendant of hominins who left Africa a uh, long time ago. And so geneticists tell us that the, the, the sort of split point between the lineage leading to us and to Neanderthals is somewhere in the past around 650 or 700,000 years ago. So it's a long time, 700,000 years ago. But obviously, it's not enough to become completely isolated from the, the reproductive point of view. Um, so there is this, this long, uh, long evolution. And of course, there are many changes along this, these things. And so uh, the Neanderthals that are uh, 40,000 years old are quite different from creatures which are half a million years uh, ago along the, the line leading to the, to the Neanderthal. So th there is this separation. Now, uh, we have indications that uh, African hominins that are ancestral to us left Africa likely more than once and when they left africa and they were in the i would say at the gate of of africa in in southwest asia in places like israel or yeah. arabia or places like that uh, they they met other hominids and so we think there was already probably contacts between these two lineages uh, maybe 300,000 years ago or, or more. So we, we think there, there are already contacts there and there are genetic evidence that seem to support this notion. Um, but, but so far, these this movements did not go very far. Uh, and so then it's, 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 there are several episodes where we see African hominins in the Levant, uh, 180,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, and and uh, it looks like probably there are different, I would say, waves, and there are probably, you know, uh, movement back and forth. We we don't know all the details, but there is a zone where the contacts took place. But now, when you look at the 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 last. Uh, the last episode, and, and when we try to measure when uh, the contact that took place in, in between Neanderthals and, and uh, the ancestors of present-day humans left some trace in the genome of present-day humans, you don't go that back in time. We're talking about maybe you know 80,000 or 60,000, something like that. Mm. And so this probably took place already in the Levant, and then when when uh, the ancestors of present-day Asians and present-day Europeans expanded in Eurasia, there were probably other opportunities of contacts with Neanderthals, with Denisovans. So 
we are talking probably about several episodes of contacts, maybe one or two leaving more traces in present day population than others. And uh, if you look at the Neanderthals before uh, the the Homo sapiens came to the Near East or to to Europe, and after, is there a change in their behavior? Is like uh, you you said, uh, sometimes there are things that others would call arts or tools. Is this evolving now quicker because they are influenced by Homo sapiens? That, that's that's another uh, say big dispute in, in the field of paleoanthropology. Um, because we, you know, what we have mostly is stone tools. Okay. And so we see stone tools evolving through time. And sometimes there are invention, evolutions, uh, innovations. And the, the question is constantly whether when you see the same thing occurring two times, if it's a completely independent Uh, event or if there is some kind of relationship and and the answer is not simple um, for example uh, to move back uh, 200 300 thousand years ago uh, there is a change in the way to uh, shape stone tools there are certain techniques to Uh, produce flakes, for example, and we see these things happening in Africa and also in other places and even in Europe. And for some people, it simply means that uh, there are independent inventions of the same thing by different groups. But now, for example, now that we have this evidence of a possible gene exchange between Neanderthals and and uh, and uh, Homo sapiens, more or less in this time range, you know, some people say, well, maybe, you know, if, if you have, if you have contacts and if you exchange genes, it's, it's not impossible that some behavior would spread from one group to another. Um, now they are, when you, when you come closer to us, I think for the last Uh, I would say the the, the last uh, period of contact when when really the, the the final replacement of Neanderthals took place. From my point of view, that's not everybody thinks the same way, but from my point of view, there are things that the last Neanderthals, very last, like forty forty two thousand years ago, there are things that they did that they never did before. Mm. And they did these things just at the moment where they were already uh, Homo sapiens of African origins in Europe and, and doing the same things. So to me, it's too much of coincidences. And I think it's likely that there were uh, interaction between these groups. Uh, and, and when I say interaction, there were cases where individuals would pass from one group to another. Uh, we have hybrids, we have, we have humans, modern humans that had in their ancestry a Neanderthal just a, a couple of generations before. And so if you imagine an individual or several individuals, um, you know, imagine you, you have a group of, a small group of hunter-gatherers Uh, modern Homo sapiens moving into into Eastern Europe, into the Balkans, and basically they are moving into the lands of Neanderthals. Uh, there are very few, and at some point, for some any reason, they would they would um, incorporate three females Neanderthal in their group. Uh, well, these Neanderthals, they, they knew things that they, they were doing things that this guy did not, did not used to do because they were coming from another place and another sure. environment. Do we have evidence of uh, intermixed groups that were like living together? We, we don't have group, intermixed groups, but we have evidence of, we have individuals from this time period We are obvious the descendants of a, a mixed couple mm. 
So it, it means that they interbreed, but we don't know if they formed groups together. We don't have any evidence of that. Mm. You know, when you, we know now that uh, at the end of the story, uh, we have a period which is much longer and much more complex than uh, we used to think. In fact, between the moment we have the first African, uh, I mean, not African, but of African origin, Homo sapiens moving into the Balkans and Eastern Europe. And the moment where the last Neanderthals are going to got extinct in Western Europe, there is probably at least five or 6,000 years, mm. at least. And so it does not mean that these guys, they coexisted for centuries in the same place. They coexist at the, size, at the, at the scale of Europe. But now uh, the question is uh, how, you know, um, uh, how do, how, I mean, what kind of interaction they had, you know? And, uh, and, and we see also that the, the, this, this modern Homo sapiens moving into Europe, there are probably seven waves. First was not very successful, did not make it further than Central Europe. Uh, probably there are very few people, very small groups. So the replacement was not that fast, that easy, I would say, and, and, and all sorts of things happen. But what we see is that the last Neanderthals in Western Europe, they are making pendants made of teeth of animals that look very much like those carried by uh, Homo sapiens in the Balkans just a couple of centuries before. Mm. I don't think it's just chance. I think it's, uh, you know, you, you, you can imagine that if there were hybrids around, you know, you might have, for example, let's say, look, in, in present-day humans, there they are in Africa regions where Bantu language speakers who, who are farmers, I mean, they, are, they, they have cattle and they... they interact with pygmies of the forest who are initially primarily hunter-gatherers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they take, uh, the, the, these guys, they take Bantu wives, uh, they take, uh, excuse me, pygmy wives with them. And it happens that these pygmy wives, they, they sometimes they return with the, the, their, their original group, their, their family, and they return with their offspring. So, you know, you, you imagine that in situation like that, if you imagine a situation like that between Neanderthals and, and, uh, and modern Homo sapiens, so then, you know, uh, these guys moving back to uh, one group or another, they would not forget what they, you know, they have seen, what they have learned, what they have practiced maybe for half of their life. And so, on the long term, over centuries, it's impossible that the presence of these different groups would not influence each, each other. You know, absolutely, I'm absolutely certain of that. But you, you just said the word like the last Neanderthal. Do you think there was a last one, or did just because of this interbreeding, the Neanderthals like dissolve into the Homo sapiens, or was there actually an extinction? Well, that's a bit. I would say, again, rhetorical. Because some people, they don't like this notion that Neanderthals got extinct. My point is that there are no Neanderthals around. You don't see anything looking like a Neanderthal. So for me, Neanderthals got extinct. Right. The fact that some of them interbred with some uh, Homo sapiens does not change much. In fact, honestly, I think the... Uh, you know, you and I, we carry about 2% of Neanderthal DNA. But when you say that, it does not mean much because it does not mean that your features are 2% of, of a Neanderthal. Uh, because this 2% of DNA, you know, maybe most of it does not code for much, you know. So in the end, the question is how many features are expressed in the phenotype, which means in the biology, in the looking, etc., in present-day Europeans coming from Neanderthals. 
honestly, for me, it's peanuts. Uh, I think what we know is that we have part of our genome um, uh, uh, coding our immune system for which we, we sort of um, uh, imported some interesting genes from Neanderthals because they help with the protection against local pathogens or things like that. There are a couple of things which are related to the environment, the temperature, the UV, the, uh, how much, uh, you know, the fat metabolism and things like that. But generally speaking, I think it's very, very, very little uh, in terms of, if you, if you look at the, 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 the broader picture of the features. So to me, it's a, re it's, primarily a replacement, whatever the reason are. You know, people have argued that it's just because of demography, because there are so few people that, mm. you know, one group got basically swamped into, uh, I mean, one group swamped the other one or something like that. That is related to biology, to um, demography, some kind of not very good interaction between groups. But I think essentially it's a it's a replacement, but it's a it's a leaky replacement. It's a replacement with leaks. Mm. <laughs> so uh, it's it it has it, it there is a little bit of uh, of Neanderthal in us, but a tiny 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 bit. Perhaps that explains the appendix that no one knows what it's for. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, we have, do we have any clue why the Homo sapiens was the one hominin that survived till today, or was it just luck? Oh, I don't believe it's luck. I, I think that that's also another popular uh, notion. Uh, especially among, uh, I would say, Neanderthal supporters. <laughs> Well, you know, frankly, I'm a Neanderthal supporter. Uh, I, I made my career thanks to the Neanderthals. And, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, I was quite successful thanks to the Neanderthals. So I'm very grateful to the Neanderthals. I like Neanderthals. But this being said, um, uh, I don't think it's just by chance that uh, we are on Earth and not Neanderthals. And my argument is very simple because people have tried have tried to imagine because of course if you if you say it's just chance, it means you know Neanderthals are just like us they are just other kind of humans and just by chance they could you know uh, they could be here and we would not be here like like you would say. If the Aztecs would have had uh, guns and uh, boats, maybe they would invade uh, Spain and exterminate all Europeans. And today, they would be only Amerindians living in Europe. I think I think the situation in the Paleolithic time is is completely different. And people have have tried to use the climate, uh, some kind of natural disasters, all sorts of things to explain why Neanderthals got extinct. And I tell you, for me, the real question is not why the Neanderthal are not here, is why we are everywhere. Mm. And it's not just the Neanderthals that got replaced, it's everything. The Denisovan got replaced, the Homo floresiensis got replaced, the Homo naledi got replaced. Everything that was not Homo sapiens was replaced at different times in different places. But in the end, it's what happened. It was not fast. It was not um, just one way. Sometimes there was some kind of, but in the end, this is what happened everywhere. And so the only common factor for all these events is us. Correct. Is us. And so the, the, what we have to look for is what is what is going on with Homo sapiens that make him such a uh, problematic species for other species? So uh, there is nothing wrong with Neanderthals. 
And there is nothing wrong with climate because, you know, Neanderthal experienced all sorts of climatic disasters before Homo sapiens moved into Europe. But clearly, let's say after 45,000 years ago, they did not survive the last expansion of our species. And, and this happened everywhere. It happened um, earlier or later in other places, but it happens. And so the question is, what makes Homo sapiens special? And uh, I think this is what we have to investigate. And you are speaking about the brain. Uh, yeah, maybe there is something, you know, in, we're talking about different cognitive skills and uh, we're talking about technology, about complexity. I mean, in general, poetic archaeologists put a lot of emphasis on, on techniques because this is what they have. Sure. And there, there are many archaeologists who think that they can sort of measure the intelligence of ancient hominins by looking at the techniques to produce points or blades or whatever. I think maybe it doesn't count. Maybe, I mean, it's nice that you can make nice things, uh, points and glue and things like that. But eventually, maybe what counts the most is the kind of, you know, one day a reporter asked me, if you would, could take a, uh, an engine to travel uh, you know, a machine mm. to travel through time. Time machine, yeah. What would you like to know about Neanderthal? You would go in t in past, and you would you would learn something. And I, I told him, I said, what I would like to know is the kind of relationship that a Neanderthal had with his brother-in-law. And and we don't know. I don't know what the relationship was, um, uh, because in groups of recent homo sapiens we know that what our family relationship and the fact that if you know that behind the mountain you have somebody in a village that is your brother-in-law and an event and you could go there and ask for help for something it makes a big difference i don't know if this existed in among neanderthals or not mm. and uh, and i think uh, it's possible that is this level of networking and uh, uh, I would say cohesion of groups, of large groups that made a difference. Um, but it's also possible that, you know, the demography of, uh, of uh, Homo sapiens was uh, stronger than the one of other groups. Maybe that's simple, who knows? But there is something, there is something in our species that, that must explain this, this uh, replacement. Uh, coming back to the brain, we, we discussed the fact that the brain is, is, is big in, in Neanderthals and present-day humans and in Denisov, et cetera. But still, there are differences, and we know differences, that these differences existed. Why? Because the, the, the structure, the morphology of the brain is different. There are some parts of our brain that are remarkably developed compared to other hominins. For example, there is a part of the of the brain in the back of the of the of the skull that we call the cerebellum. So I would say cerebellum was a bit neglected for a long time, but now we know that cerebellum is involved in many uh, in many tasks. It called it helps to coordinate um, motricity. Uh, but we know also that it's involved in other, it's connected to other parts of the brain. It's involved in a, a rewarding circuits. It's involved in social interaction. It's involved in language. Mm. Cerebellum is, is really big in our species, bigger than any other, in any other large brain hominids. Maybe it says something about what we do with our brain and especially our cerebellum. Yeah, I, I like this this network thought because I mean, uh, from the fossil records of Neanderthals, as far as I understand, we can say that they had some group cohesion because if uh, you have Neanderthals who used to have uh, very uh, severe injuries but they survived uh, and the injuries healed, so that means that there was a group that 
cared about this person, about this individual, and and fed it while it was was down on on the bed. So there seems to be some social cohesion, but we don't know, and probably there's no way of finding out how different groups interacted which with each other. Like you like you said, when you're behind the mountain, you have the brother-in-law. You is there any way you think to to find out if there was any communication between those groups? No, but what we 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 know things about uh, the movement of people on the on the landscape, and so we know that a group of Neanderthals had a certain territory that they they uh, where they moved around through through the year. They would collect different raw materials, move one place to another, etc. Again, I mean, you know, I would not like to say that there is no networking at all or no, because, for example, if you look at the, the stone technology, in the, uh, it's more in the last Neanderthals, I mean, but we see that we have large, we have some kind of regional entities. Mm. You know? there, there are some ways to make tools that you find over large regions. Why? I don't think it's by chance. It's because probably there was some kind of uh, exchanges between this group. Maybe it was individual. Maybe they would, you know, trade, uh, I would say, swap uh, females or kidnap them or whatever. Or there they was some kind of cohesion because you find, for example, between, say, Germany, Poland, and now we, we see that even as far as Caucasus, a certain style of, of uh, tool making that you find about everywhere. And it's quite distinctive from what you would find, say, in places like France, for example, at the same time. So there is some kind of cultural differentiation, I would say, between these groups. But is it as strong and, uh, I would say, efficient that what we see in, uh, in later uh, homines, uh, es- I mean, especially later Homo sapiens, I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, I think, I think this might have been uh, uh, something, uh, you know, my view on, on all this is I, I often take this picture. We have all these hominins. They are, they are always, they are, I mean, the large brain hominins, they're all going to more complexity somehow. Uh, so imagine uh, a stove where you have several saucer, pla- saucer pans with, with uh, milk uh, sort of heating mm-hmm. and starting to boil. And what happened is that one of these saucer pans uh, in one of the saucer pans, the, 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 the milk starts really boiling and goes over the edge of the saucer pan, goes all over the stove and turn off the, the gas everywhere. Mm-hmm. I think it's what happens with, with the Homo sapiens. <laughs> I like that, that analogy. Is that they, they were evolving, you know, they were all evolving. But probably what happened is that our species at some point past a sort of threshold that then accelerate its, its demographic expansion and geographic mm. expansion. Maybe it was not a big difference with the other, but it was enough. And yeah. you know, we, we have many examples in nature today of uh, what we call invading species. Mm-hmm. So you have uh, you know, crawfish. Correct fishes that were imported from from America in Western Europe because you know for they were more interesting for people uh, breeding crawfish and this species is now eliminating the local crawfish in many places they are not smarter you know but there is something there is a, a small difference that make their reproductive success higher and so gradually they're replacing the other species. And so, again, I mean, coming back to my story with Homo sapiens, maybe the, the you know, I, I'm convinced that in, in the, the lifestyle of all these groups, there were a lot of similarities. But there are differences also. And maybe this difference was not huge, but it was enough for systematic, at some point, not in the beginning, 
in the beginning we see a sort of you know for hundreds of thousand years there were neanderthals in europe the Denisovans in asia homo sapiens in in um in africa with some time they were a bit out of africa because of climatic changes and the sahara and arabia became green they moved a bit into this area but there was a sort of balance between all these groups but clearly after some point i, I would say 50000 years ago then there is a movement starting that at some point becomes almost irresistible and so i think is more like a an acceleration uh, a threshold that has been passed uh, is bad luck for the others but but they passed it earlier and they like, really have waited a long time the underdog would have done something uh, but they you know it did not happen and like you say um that uh, with your fish example uh, it doesn't even mean that we intentionally wiped them out it might just be that we were the invading species and uh, perhaps uh, uh their their hunting grounds were empty because of us or something like this so it doesn't mean that we intentionally killed the neanderthals oh i don't think there was a decision to make a genocide of neanderthals somewhere <laughs> for sure No, but it uh, might be that there were fights a lot this, between those, uh, more, those groups, right? Well, these are more reserved on this aspect. I mean, going back to what we were discussing in the beginning of our interview, uh, my vision of humans is not as uh, optimistic as that of many of my colleagues. But um, if you look what's going on with, with modern hunter-gatherers, and people who uh, still live in places where they are not controlled by the police, the army, the administration, uh, well, they are not always very friendly with the neighbors. Huh? So uh, I think uh, the notion that, uh, you know, uh, conflicts did not exist in the past, I think, honestly, I don't believe it. I think there were conflicts. I think... You know, if you, if you are a group of hunter-gatherers and uh, and there is a conflict with uh, another group because of uh, exploitation of a resource or a hunting in one place or another, you know, if you can go there and kill the men and take the woman, you do it. And I think they did it. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, I, I'm not saying they did it systematically. Correct. But It happened, it happened, and the problem is if it happens more in one direction than the other, uh, and especially speaking about groups that are not big, uh, yeah, on the, on the long term, you know, it means one group can basically vanish. Uh, and so uh, I think in terms of interactions between uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, everything happened. Uh, that's what I think. I think mm -hmm. they probably... I think there are probably some kind of mechanism of mutual exclusion. I don't, I don't think they were living for centuries together some, some place. I think uh, uh, th there were probably some kind of sharing of uh, the, the continent. Uh, there are places where there are one group or another or more of one group or another. There are situations where they would... Uh, have some kind of neutral interaction. There were situations where they would exchange individuals, partners, uh, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, and there were situations probably where there were conflicts and they would, you know, uh, I don't think they Can we But see from the fossil record that where, I mean, the, the Homo sapiens, as you said, didn't just get to Europe at, uh, at one time. So they, they gradually walked into uh, the continent. Can we see that where the Homo sapiens arrived first, the Neanderthals um, got extinct earlier? Is that uh, from the fossil record? Uh, we don't have such a good record. Uh -huh. We're already happy to see where we are the oldest uh, uh, Homo sapiens in Europe and uh, where we have the last Neanderthals. When not surprisingly, the oldest Homo sapiens are in the east, the last Neanderthals are in the west, which makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. uh, what we don't have really 
is a, uh, an archaeological record where you would see Homo sapiens coming and Neanderthals coming back and then uh, again and again. We don't have this really. Mm. So again, I think probably after 40, 40, 40 I mean, after 45,000, I think when there was replacement, it was probably a one-way ticket. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't see this happening uh, you know, one possible mechanism, we're talking about climate, uh, one possible mechanism is that environmental changes were very sometimes brutal. Uh, and what's possible is that, so we know that with Neanderthals, they were able to contract when, when uh, their population contract in refugees, when conditions were not very good, and then they would recolonize Europe. So this happened several times throughout climatic cycles. So what's possible is that uh, in this period when, when um, Homo sapiens started to settle in the mid latitude of Eurasia, which is a rather unstable period, there were territories that were made, I would say, impossible <coughs> for humans, Neanderthals or uh, homo sapiens. Then when the condition would become a bit better, it's possible that homo sapiens were more able or faster in reoccupying this empty space. Mm. And if this happened several times, so then yes, in the end they would basically swamp the, the, the Neanderthal populations. Do, do we know anything about how large Neanderthal groups became? You mean in total or? Uh, no, no, the, 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 the single group, like the, the family living in a cave, because if you're talking about conflict, the size of a group might be a big advantage. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there, are, there are some estimates, but, uh, you know, by the way, when you look at hunter-gatherers, even modern hunter-gatherers, you see that uh, there, there are sort of boundaries uh, when a group is smaller than, you know, 20 people or something like that, it's really at risk. Mm. So if there is anything happening, uh, any kind of, we're talking about climate, you know, a very bad winter or whatever, they may not survive at all. Uh, then if a group is more than, say, uh, you know, 100 or in one place, so then you start having issues about if you are if you are a hunter, you hunt animals uh, to really on a given territory to uh, extract enough food from the environment. Yeah. So we're always talking about numbers between uh, you know let's say probably a minimum number of say thirty individuals and eighty or something like that, and uh, it can be more, but not much more. We are not talking about thousands of people in one place, and we are not talking about five either. So we we have a, a notion, and that was probably the case for Neanderthal and for uh, early Homo sapiens. Mm. By the way, this is one of the ways we estimate the population size, oh, because, okay. but yeah, because if you you know, we have an idea of what is the kind of territory of these groups, because we see where they collect their raw material, uh, where they go to hunt, etc. So we're talking about, uh, let's say, a circle that can be somewhere between uh, 50 kilometers, array of 50 and 100 kilometers, something like that. Or they move in this kind of, of uh, region. So then after, you know, it's, uh, you say, okay, for this type of lithic assemblage that is known in Western Europe among uh, the last Neanderthals, okay, uh, a group that can be between 30 and 100 needs a territory that is between, you know, a circle um, of 100 kilometer of diameter and maybe 200 or something like that. And then on the map, you put, circles of this size and you count how many people in each circle and you take the minimum and the maximum and you have a notion 
mm. of what can be the population size. And when you do that, you see that, uh, well, it does not make a lot of people. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, people have, uh, I mean, there are people who made estimates that maybe in Western Europe, there was something like, you know, 10,000 Neanderthals. Mm. Uh, maybe this estimate is false. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. But it gives a notion of the, the order of magnitude of, this, of these populations. We're, on, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands or millions we're talking about. Um, you know, when, when the, of course, the conditions are very different, but when the Danish, they started exploring the, the, the Greenland, mm. So they made the Inuits there and they made a list of, they did something fantastic. They listed all individuals that they would meet, uh, their family relationship, etc. And then they would come every, every summer to visit the same groups. So we have this record over, you know, generations. And uh, along all the east coast of Greenland, which is a long you know, it's mm -hmm. something from uh, northern France to Portugal or, you know, or uh, Netherlands to Portugal or something like that. Yeah. Along this coast, these guys, when they first came, they found 499 Inuits. No. That's not that much. No, that's not much. And so it, it says, uh, you know, well, okay, Greenland is, is uh, maybe it's a bit extreme. But um, in, in the periglacial environment, uh, you might have sometime uh, some of these paralytic populations shrinking to very small numbers. Mm. And uh, if you're talking about 10,000 Neanderthals, uh, if you think about invading species and perhaps uh, external effects like a climate change or whatever, it doesn't seem that unlikely to, to wipe off 10,000 people off Europe. No, but plus, uh, you know, okay, there are two things. First of all, I think this population was fluctuating a lot through time mm. because of climatic fluctuation, A. And B, you should not think on Europe as a, a of course, today you travel in Europe, there are people everywhere. Uh, sure. A very few places where there is nobody. But, but um, if you move back in the Paleolithic times, you know, it's very likely that there were, there were regions that were uh, favorable to humans and there were many, I mean many, there are groups of hunter gatherers, but there are probably also regions where there was nobody or, or regions where sometimes they would go for some reasons, but, but they would not permanently live there. So uh, think on an empty world. Huh? Uh, and this is probably the, the, the good picture for the, the Paleolithic time in Europe. Mm. And it's a picture we will end off because you told me you have like half, one and a half hours. We're way over this. So let me just finish off with one final question. And it gets back to what we uh, talked about in the beginning, that different cultures have a different uh, interest in, in uh, your studies because uh, some are more on, on you know, things that, that actually help them today and others are more interested in uh, things like paleontology. So question to you is, why do you think is it important for us to know about our very, very ancient past? Oh, I think, uh, you know, there is a very nice... Uh, quotes that unfortunately I don't know by art by uh, Thomas Huxley where he, he wrote a book about uh, the origin of humans back in the 19th century and he says he says uh, the question of uh, where we come from and what is the meaning of our presence on, on earth and what is our relationship with nature and etc is a question that comes to the mind of any human being uh, born to conscience or something like that i think it's true i think humans they you know humans they need explanations so they when people they have no explanation for something going on they invent one 
you know that that was met the success of many religions by the way and so when we don't have an explanation we find one and yeah. so uh, the the question of origin i think is is absolutely present and um, and of course on top of that there is a fascination for it's very exotic you know when when prehistory was invented i would say in the 19th century uh, suddenly, people living in big cities in Europe uh, realized that uh, before them, before history, there was a, a world that was extremely exotic uh, there, you know, under their feet. You could find the bones of uh, hippos and elephants and lions uh, that lived in places like London or Paris, you know. And I think. Um, Prehistory is is a. Sometimes I regret it, but sometimes I like it. But it's it's also a land of of dream and fantasies, and uh, and humans need also dreams and fantasies. And so, um, just like me as a child, I like to escape into you know I said the beauties of past natures. Uh, I think humans, they like to escape in other worlds. Uh, and, uh, and the past offer a lot of, uh, of ground for this kind of dreaming. And with that, I think we perfectly uh, finished the circle to the beginning. Uh, Mr. Abla, thank you very much for your time for almost two hours. It was very interesting to me. Uh, is there anything we should mention? I saw that you have a Twitter feed and that you wrote some books. Yes, I have a, a Twitter feed. Uh, you can, I think, easily find me, uh, JJHUBLIN, on Twitter. I don't tweet always too much. But I tweet sometime, and um, I used to write books uh, for. Uh, I, in the past, I, I, I wrote a number of books for children. Actually, when I was a young scientist, uh, <clears throat> and and now have have uh, of course more recent book productions. But uh, I would say they are they are too serious. They are, <laughs> are uh, yeah. In general, they are not for the general public, or more for my colleagues. Did you write scientific books for children? Well, I wrote books for about uh, prehistoric animals and uh, things like that, and prehistory of humans. Uh, well, frankly speaking, uh, I needed to make a living when I was a student. <laughs> and so uh, I, I found this, uh, temporary jobs of writing uh, books that today I would not have time to write, actually. <laughs> what a pity, because when, when I was a kid, I don't know, you're now 15 years in Germany, do you know the Was ist Was books? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I loved those as a, as a child. And this is the same, like learning, having fun is, is the best way of learning. So... Well, uh, f uh, to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working on a book for... Uh, general public uh, for a French editor and uh, this lady twists my arms every <laughs> <laughs> rightly so rightly so yeah. so let's hope that this one gets uh, translated to German or at least to English I guess probably to yeah. <laughs> okay thanks a lot Mr. Blanc okay goodbye bye bye